gospel lesson on this Transfiguration Sunday comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the 17th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Just prior to this portion of the scripture, uh, there has been an encounter between Jesus and the disciples and Satan or the deceiver, the father of all lies, and uh, this immediately follows that conversation. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and the brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is really good for us to be here. And if you wish, I will make three dwelling places here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice came saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. I am well pleased. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I need all the little people up here. We're going to have a little party this morning, so come on up. And if you consider yourself a little person but happen to be taller, please feel free. All right, come on up. We're going to have a seat on the steps here. We're going to talk about that. Have a seat, have a seat. Hi, sweetheart. Okay. So, oh, thanks. Wow, it is a treasure chest. This is not for you, Daddy. This one is for me? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so today is, I know. I know, it's very cool. Um, Pastor, Pastor um, Susan was just talking about um, how Jesus went to the top of a mountain with some of his followers. Did you do? Awesome. Well, guess what they did at the top of that mountain? They had a party. They had a party. And you know what Christians say when we have a party? You know the special word? You might have heard it. The choir just sang it over and over and over again. Okay. Anybody remember? What is it? Any of you that can read? What does this say? Yeah, let's have a little party up here. Everybody start saying, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's how Christians, um, we have a party. Because you know what hallelujah means? It means, yeah, you're really good at it, May. That's awesome. See, you're having like a party on that piece of paper. That's pretty awesome. I know. Well, hallelujah means praise the Lord. Because we're really grateful to God, right? For all the things. Hold on for one second, Leland. Um, so when we have a party, we, we praise the Lord, right? Yeah, because we're grateful to God for all that God has done for us. But can, do you guys have parties all the time? Like when it's your birthday, do you party all the time? Like every day, all day? No. You have special times, right? Right, we have, hold on one second, okay, May? Hold on one second. I am almost done here. 
Yes, no, there's not a cake. Oh. But today we are going to have our last party because we're going to go into a special church time and it's called Lent for six whole weeks. I know, it's 40 days. It's a long time. But look in here. So in order to not have our party for six weeks, look what we're going to put in our box. You want to put your, yours in there, Leland? Yeah, and I have one. Wait, I need to write my name on it. Can I go get yeah, you can do it later, too. We can write our name on it later. But what I'm going to ask you guys to do is you're going to help the adults have their last party today after Pastor Susan talks. So I'm going to give this. Lily, would you carry this down for me? You're going to follow Lily down the hall here. And you're going to come back up for our final party in a little while, okay? That was very anticlimactic, but it'll get more climactic later. Let us join together in prayer. Oh, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts take these ancient old words and bring them alive, that we might be touched by grace during our broken alleluias. Amen. It is good to be with you today. My name is Susan Meyer. I am the Presbyter for Common Life in Maumee Valley Presbytery. And it is my privilege to spend time with congregations as they undergo transitions. So for today, we'll be reflecting on the, the themes of this Sunday, which is Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration means to be, to be changed in our person. Uh, your session is currently searching for an interim pastor who will uh, begin in the near future, we hope. Uh, they've had interviews and they will continue to have interviews. Uh, and there will be uh, someone coming to spend a couple of years with you as you go through a time of refiguring, transforming uh, who you are as a congregation. So, today we begin with our focus upon the word of the Lord. Jesse has invited us through the children uh, to take on a new Lenten discipline she has invited us to bury the Alleluias for six weeks. She, through the children, she has invited them to stop the party for a period of time. It comes from the spiritual discipline of fasting, and I, I confess I was unfamiliar with this practice, uh, completely unfamiliar. I was brought up, learned to talk in Louisiana where we had Mardi Gras. Now I knew all about Mardi Gras. I knew, even though I was younger, what I remember is holding up my hand saying, hey mister, throw me some, as we watched the parades that would go through the streets of New Orleans. So I had a sense that I knew what it meant to have a great big celebration and then to give something up for Lent. Giving up something for Lent is a kind of fasting that allows us to pay attention to what we might ordinarily miss. And although the concept of burying alleluias make, may make some of us uncomfortable, our Lenten disciplines take us on a journey with Jesus. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we, we pivot away from the twinkling stars of Christmas, and we turn towards the deep wilderness of Lent. 
We leave in the background the babe so appealing in the manger to turn towards the Christ of the cross and the empty tomb. On Christmas Eve, we sang, Hark the herald angels sing, ah, ah, alleluia. And on Easter, no doubt, we will again sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, ah, 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 alleluia. Aren't you glad I'm not singing? <laughs> and if we were Christmas and Easter Christians only, we might be able to live on the Alleluia side of life. I confess I would much rather live on the Alleluia side of life. You probably know what I mean, the life where the children are great, marriage is wonderful, everything is peachy keen, a kind of Lake Wobegon world where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. I got that right this time. Early service completely messed that up. Anyway, in Lake Wobegon world, people are always strong. No one ever hurts someone else's feelings. The bank balance is always enough. You're never afraid. You don't struggle with despair or grief or addiction or self-sabotage. You're always right, never wrong. Your life is a constant alleluia. A quick glance at the newspaper or at at least my own life would prove that the world in which most of us live is not an alleluia world all the time. And even if we can be absolutely convinced that God's love and justice will ultimately live out and win out in the big picture, on a day-to-day -day basis, we much more often live with broken alleluias. You've heard Leonard Cohen's song, no doubt. I won't attempt to sing it, for which you can all be very grateful. I have a monotone singing voice, but here are the words. There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which you heard, the holy or the broken, alleluia. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. And even though it went all wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but broken, alleluia. Your partner is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Your child gets hooked on heroin. Your friend is sick and tired of being sick and tired. You don't know why someone else is blind to the truth. You wonder how come your spouse never he seems to hear what you're trying to say. Down the tr street, a truck suspected of being a meth lab crashes into the center of your town. The political scene is divided into camps that cannot and will not talk to each other. Your church is in transition again. Broken alleluias, these. And this is life. Mortal life, messy life. Life as it really is, not the cleaned up version that we sometimes bring to our Sunday worship. It's no wonder Sunday school teachers want only to teach the miracles, 
during Lent because after all, the cross is so depressing to teach to children for six whole weeks. It's no wonder Good Friday services are, are sparsely attended because after all, who wants to willingly enter utter desolation, the utter desolation of nailing hope to the cross? God's way of dealing with the world of broken hearts and broken alleluias is not, thank God, to leave us on the, our own. Look what happens here in this scripture lesson, how God tries to get through to us in the midst of our brokenness. First, the spectacular. After an encounter with Satan, the great deceiver, the liar, Jesus heads up the mountain with three disciples and the spectacular happens. The biblical language says physically Jesus was changed. His face like the sun, garments, light. Theater geeks and ball players know about this kind of spectacular. Spectacular happens just before the standing ovation in a musical theater when the performance is breathtaking and you find you're on your feet before you know what your hands are doing. Spectacular is the last minute and a half of a Super Bowl game when your team is the winner only 10 times, 100 times greater, spectacular is the moment awe breaks into the ordinary. And I'd like to believe that it's enough to change lives forever. You know, you go away on the mountaintop experience and you, you know that life has changed for you forever. You head home from the baseball game Hoping to hold on to that ecstasy at least for one more day, you leave the parking lot of the theater and put a message on Facebook that your life's dream has been fulfilled. Or you are Peter and James and John and you say, I know, this is great. I'm gonna hold on to this. I'm gonna make three dwellings and we can stay here forever, Jesus. If only we could box the spectacular in and keep it under wraps or under tent flaps or within one dwelling place where you could be sure that you could find that experience again when you needed that boost that the spectacular brings but we don't stay on the mountaintop. And God is not ever to be limited that way. There's more to the way that God yearns to get in touch with us. Words speak from the beyond. This is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Don't box him in. He is the very yearning of God to be in deep relationship with us. A deep relationship that is not bound by structure or booths or tents or our own desire to keep God in a manner that we can hold on to. The great mysterious voice comes because God is seeking with us, with you, a relationship where mystery and reality intersect. And so Jesus touches, physically 
touches the disciples. The presence of God in the here and now touches Peter and James and John because it is not the spectacular, but is in the touch that God's yearning for relationship is fulfilled because we need the touch of the body of Christ. In Matthew, in Matthew, touch is a sign of healing, an announcement that community is restored, and that a pronouncement that the kingdom of God has come, has arrived. The touch of the carpenter breaks open life so that human life is rearranged. There's room in the body of Christ for God's action. Remember, remember all the times in Matthew where touch happens and healing occurs. The leper, the leper is made clean and taken out of isolation. The prodigal grief stricken father is brought back to life. The one who was frozen in place, the paralytic, stands and walks. The blind see clearly. One who could not hear suddenly has his ears open. Another who could not get the words out to say what they mean gets words to speak. Those who are fearful are comforted. And the children, the children are brought close into the inner circle of the body of Christ. These hands of the carpenter king are rough and cracked from absorbing splinters, hewing wood, and those are the hands that reach out to touch. The the hands of the body of Christ literally lack SPF 50 sunscreen. They are dried and darkened by by working under Middle Eastern blistering sun, but those rough and tumble, cracked and splintered hands are the ones that make life without fear possible. The hands of the body of Christ will, in the days ahead, wash the dirty feet of the disciples. These hands would be stretched out on a cross. These hands would turn over temples, tables in the temple, They bear scars no lotion can heal and no oil can soothe. But these are the hands, the very hands of the body of Christ that break open Christian community, rearranging life so that there is room for God in our movements. For many years in my first call in Worcester, Ohio, I was chaplain to a group of parents whose children had died. It was a group that never wanted any new members. We always hoped that we would go out of existence because there would be no need to be together. When my own Stepdaughter Amy died a couple of years ago. One of those parents sent me a poem from Mary Oliver's book called In Blackwater Woods. Now it had been 30 years since I had heard from him. But here's the poem. Every year Everything I have learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss 
whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever fully know, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends upon it. And when the time comes, to let it go. To let it go. During this Lent, you are invited to bury the Alleluia's during worship so that you can explore what faith looks like in this world of broken Alleluia's. You are invited to journey on this journey with Jesus so that you might love what is even if it means loving something that is messy and uncomfortable, you are invited on this Lenten journey to be the hands of the body of Christ, to set fear aside, because fear, at least in the world of faith, Fear doesn't take us anywhere good. It is the casting out of fear that the scriptures over and over and over again at Christmas and Easter and every time in between, it is the casting out of fear that takes you straight to the heart of God. So reach out, body of Christ. Reach out and touch now in this mortal life. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, reach out and touch us. Heal broken lives and hearts. Change our mortal life that we might be your body here on earth. Reclaim our broken alleluias so that we are well prepared to rise and sing that you are indeed risen again. Amen. <laughs>